Good afternoon, everybody. This is another edition of the Passball Show, brought to you, of course, by JohnPielli.com, as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Uh, lots of stuff we're going to get into today. The number, if you're interested in being part of the program, is 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. Uh, just a reminder, of course, uh, you can always comment on the Passball Show Facebook page feed on uh, Facebook Live as well as Periscope. Uh, we'll try to keep the conversation going in regards to what's on your mind, the listener, the viewer, the whole thing. Um, next week, I do I got an exciting announcement. I'll be back on WCTC in Somerset. We will uh, be doing a show, Mike Sanfilippo and I, with uh, another guest host. We'll be on from 7 to 9 p.m. on 1450 a.m. and WCTCAM.com. I'm also going to live stream that as well. We'll, we'll we're actually going to do you know multi versions of the program. So you can listen the way you're listening now, whether it's on Periscope or Facebook Live. We'll try to make sure that that's available for you as well. But also, if you want to listen to the radio, driving in a car, just want to turn the dial on, you, know, you get a chance to catch some of the things going on in the world of sports. A um, couple things I want to get into today. I do want to talk about the Masters, and I'm going to bring that up in a little bit. you got a couple guys leading. Um, if you look at that, day one is over, Lee. Tong Lee and Tony Fano are ahead four strokes, uh, four under through the first round. Uh, Patrick Reed, Jordan Spieth amongst those that are three under. Tiger Woods kind of up and down. And, it, you know, it, it's this is one of the most the rhetorical or most repetitive or easy things to say over and over again. But if Tiger Woods can compete, even if he's not in a position to win, even if he doesn't look like the prohibitive favorite, going into Saturday and Sunday. It's going to do ridiculous ratings. And, you know, you've seen the sport of golf kind of grow with based off the strength of Tiger Woods' participation. And if Tiger Woods is in a tournament, it's going to draw some attention. And if Tiger Woods is competing and could potentially win a tournament, like you saw at the Valspar Championships, coming down to the last couple holes, obviously his last shot, if he sunk that birdie putt on 18, he would have been in a tie for the lead with Paul Casey, who ended up winning the tournament. You know, it's obviously a big deal if Tiger Woods is competing. But, you know, the Masters seems to get a lot more ratings than most other of the majors anyway. And there's a lot of, uh, I say the diehard golf fans are always into it. But, you know, the fair weather, go weather golf fans are usually watching the Masters. You know, the Masters are kind of up th towards the equivalent of the Super Bowl as far as bringing out the majority of fair weather fans. And you see that in the NBA and you see that in the NHL when it comes to the playoffs. And, you know, the, the ones that like golf but don't really love it, you know, maybe it's some that follow tournaments here and there, play a little bit, but aren't too much into it week after week like the diehard, will be interested in the Masters. So that... You know, from a rating standpoint, you've already uh, taken the fair weather fan or the decent to good fan of golf following the sport. But obviously, if Tiger Woods is able to stay in the mix and obviously uh, not up and down first round, not really in the, the lead or the contention after day one, if he makes the cut, but a step above, if he makes the cut and he's in the race. Yeah, it's going to be a fun couple days at the Masters, but obviously you got Lee and you got Fino at four shots under after round number one. We'll obviously keep you know you posted. Um, the game, you know, the, the sport will kick on a little bit further into the afternoon tomorrow. So while we're on, hopefully we can give you some live updates. Um, you know, the Philadelphia Phillies had their opening, uh, their home opener today. And a lot of news has been made of uh, Gabe Kapler, the manager of the Phillies. And, you know, from what, you know, he's he's got some things that are a little bit different from what you expect out of your normal manager. But he's a very bright guy. He's a very good baseball man. And, you know, is going to go with a combination of analytics and his gut. And the analytics obviously are very 
prolific in the game right now. This is a guy that, when he was with the Dodgers, working in player development, was very up, you know, involved with everything that was going on in the team in regards to strategy and, you know, numbers and, you know, studying the, the outside part, uh, you know, of the game that doesn't involve the actual players and feel. So he's, he's added kind of a double thing here. He's been trying to get this bottle of water for the last five minutes. The, you know, he, he, he's kind of adding his own little feelings about how he is going to impact a baseball game that he manages. And, and I'll tell you, what stands out about this and what has drawn some ire is the fact that he has insisted that he is not going to go the whole conventional manager route. He's going to rely a lot on numbers. He's going to rely a lot on tendencies. And he is going to, you know, use his pitching staff a way that he doesn't care what anybody else thinks about it. Now, he's had a little bit of a rough week. You know, he had obviously the Hobie Milner situation, which honestly is, is, is a mistake that any manager could make at any point. Or if you don't make a, a mistake like that, you, you, you're going to make a similar mistake. It's human nature. It's nothing against Gabe Kapler as a manager, the fact that, you know, he was getting set to make a pitching change. There was some miscommunication somewhere. He thought a guy was up in a bullpen, and he wanted to make the pitching change. The thing that doesn't get spoken about a lot is the fact that the pitcher he was taken out of the game was pitching absolutely dreadful. This was the third inning. Vince Velasquez had already given up nine hits and seven runs with a couple walks. I mean, he, he was pitching dreadful. So why would Gabe Kapler not be taking his pitcher out of the game? Of course, you add the backdrop of you know him taking Aaron Nola out early on opening day, Nick Pavetta out after four innings, and going to the bullpen. He seems to be very set on not wanting his good pitchers, or his pitchers in general, his starters, to face a batting order the third time through. And I've said earlier in the week, I said my issue with it isn't that style. It isn't that way of managing. I think that could work, and especially when you're studying the numbers and you know the the statistical analysis that you've done proves that you have an advantage when you go to different pitchers or you don't leave a pitcher in too long. The issue that I have with it is I'm not necessarily sure that Gabe Kapler and the Philadelphia Phillies have a number one a deep enough bullpen, but number two the type of pitchers that you're going to put in the game in a fourth or fifth inning and expect to reasonably get you through those meaningful outs in a fifth and sixth inning, setting you up to when you face your, your good relievers in the back of the bullpen. And I'll make an example, and I'm going to touch on the New York Mets in a little bit. The Philadelphia Phillies right now don't have themselves a Robert Gesellman or a Seth Lugo. And what Robert Gesellman and Seth Lugo have going for them is... On a lot of teams, they would be good enough to be a fourth or fifth starter in their rotation. So they're major league-worthy pitchers that belong on a pitching staff. The Mets obviously have a deep enough starting rotation. Knock on wood, there hasn't been any injuries yet or any major injuries. So these pitchers are extra but are very important to the Mets because of their versatility and their, their ability to pitch in the middle of the game. So you have, for instance, like a Steven Matz the other day on Sunday, or you know a Noah Syndergaard yesterday, a pitcher that keeps the team in the game through four innings, but you see the offense is kind of getting to him. You see that the amount of pitches that they've thrown is a little too much for this part of the game, and you figure it would be a good decision at this point to take the pitcher out. You bring in a Lugo, you bring in a Gesellman, these are major league starters that you're bringing in in the middle of the game fresh. Now, all that, that idea is exactly what Gabe Kapler is looking to do in Philadelphia. He is, he is looking to use maybe an extended rotation of about six, seven, eight pitchers, maybe use four or five of them on regular rest, and use those extra starting pitchers to be able to come into a game in a fourth, fifth, or sixth inning fresh and be able to get more than one inning out of them. That's a very good idea. Unfortunately for the Phillies, it hasn't worked, and it hasn't worked for this reason. Nothing that Gabe Kapler has done. He just doesn't have a deep enough pitching staff. He doesn't have five starters 
let alone six or seven, that he could go to a starting pitcher type in the fourth or fifth inning and expect them to get you through the bulk of the game. Drew Hutchinson is a journeyman pitcher. I know he had a good year in the minor leagues for the Pittsburgh Pirates last year, but he is unlikely to hold a roster spot for the entire season. You know, you're looking at a Jake Thompson who may need a little more seasoning in AAA. You may, you know, you look at some of the other pitchers that are there and you're like, all right, they can get, you know, maybe they can pitch an inning. Maybe they can spot start for you. But, you know, if the game's 2-2 after four innings and you've decided to take Nick Pavetta out of the game, I can't trust any of these pitchers to get through a lineup as if they're a major league caliber starting pitcher. And that's the problem that Gabe Kapler is dealing with right now. It's not his philosophy. It's not the fact that he's going overboard with, you know, the micromanaging of his, you know, entire, you know, pitching staff. It's the fact that he doesn't have the right horses in the middle of the game to manage the way that he wants to. So it's going to, it's cost the Phillies a couple times this year, and it's probably going to continue to cost the Phillies over the course of the season. What they have to do is hope that they can develop a couple good young pitchers in the minor leagues, which they're looking to do. It might be beneficial to take a Jake Thompson, send him down to AAA, have him throw the ball really well, and then when he comes up to the major leagues, put him in that role where he's pitching you know, the fourth inning, the fifth inning, and the sixth inning, setting the Phillies up to get to that bullpen. Now, that bullpen is also a problem, and I mentioned this a couple days ago. It's not like you got the New York Yankees bullpen. You don't, you, you know, you don't have Mariano Rivera and Jeff Nelson and Ramiro Mendoza and John Wetland there. You, know, you got Hector Norris and a bunch of guys that you would question whether or not they were good enough to be on a major league roster now. You got those guys getting big outs in the seventh and eighth inning when you've already started by putting a marginal pitcher in the middle of the game after you took out your starter early. Now, conventional wisdom would say to leave that starter out there more, try to get more out of that starting pitcher because before you go to an absolute terrible pitcher in the middle of the game. But, you know, from a philosophy standpoint, it makes sense. Get four innings out of your starter, or four plus innings out of your starter. Go to a starter, starting caliber pitcher in the fourth or fifth or sixth inning and expect a couple good innings out of them. The problem is, I don't think the Philadelphia Phillies and Gabe Kapler can trust anybody that's coming into the game in, in the middle after the starters. And then, you know, add to that the fact that Pat Neshek and Tommy Hunter are also injured. You know, two main components of the bullpen, two free agents that were signed by general manager Matt Klintak in the offseason. You know, it's, it's a disaster. You got Jake Arrieta pitching on Sunday. You know, Jake Arrieta, you know, you hope. You give Arrieta the ball and you say, listen, we'll ride you through seven or eight because it's going to be a relief for the rest of the bullpen. And it's also going to save the team from having to put crappy, you know, marginal starting pitchers in the middle of the game where you know they can't get anybody out. The problem is not Gabe Kapler. It's the lack of talent on the Philadelphia Phillies pitching staff. They got Aaron Nola, they got Arietta, Norris, Hunter, and Neshek are good. You might have a couple reasonable arms. Adubere and Ramos, Luis Garcia. You know, Milner's looked pretty good. But outside of that, you've got a bunch of journeyman pitchers. And what they need is to get a have a pitcher or two step up and be able to take over the middle of the game. And I think they'll be a little bit better over time. But obviously the Phillies fans, opening day today in Philadelphia, booing the manager. You know, listen, you know, when it comes to booing in professional sports, um, I'm not necessarily in favor of it, but I understand it. And you know what? The fans don't have very much of a time to actually voice their opinions. They could call in to talk radio. They could, you know, yell and scream. But they know most of the time that the people that they're yelling or screaming about are not going to be there on the other side to listen or to hear what it is that they have to say. Now, you have one opening day every year. And if you're lucky enough to get to the playoffs, you'll have similar player introductions like you do on your home opener. But the home opener is the one opportunity for the fans to cheer the players that they love. To get on somebody that they may not be so happy about. But it's something that happens one time each year. 
you know, you go to the, you know, the Middle Eastern part of the country, you know, St. Louis, Chicago, likely the fans aren't doing that. You know, Chris Bryant, if he goes 0 for 12 to start the season and the Cubs are starting opening day a week later, nobody's booing Chris Bryant. They're cheering him. But I get it for opening day. And if you're a group of fans and you want to get on the manager because you're not necessarily happy with what you've seen over the first week or so, that's fine. Just understand this. Gabe Kapler didn't necessarily inherit the 1927 New York Yankees. He didn't inherit you know, the 1936 Yankees. He didn't inherit the 1913 Philadelphia Athletics. He inherited a team that is in transition, a team that is rebuilding, a team that likely when they reach the success level of getting to the playoffs on a consistent basis, will have a lot of players playing for them that aren't playing for them right now. So for those that want to run Gabe Kapler out of town because he has a unique philosophy and way of managing, I would say give him time. Because you know what? If he's given the right type of pitchers to use the way he wants to, I think his philosophy is going to work. I think he's going to be successful that way. You hear an anonymous report today given to John Heyman, who is the king of getting anonymous sources. You know, and, and I'll tell you, if you've listened to my program, whether it was years ago or you just started listening, um, I've reiterated my point enough about how I feel about reporters that get the bulk of their story from a source that whether that they may very well know, they may very well know where they got their information from, but have chosen, whether it's an agreement with the person that's given them the information or a decision that's made on their own, to not cite where they get the information from. Sometimes it works. There's very few examples, but there's a couple occasions where you, you, may not, you, you, you may not necessarily need to cite the exact place where you got the information. And I used Mark Carrig's example when he was on my show a couple months ago. Mark Carrig has heard from an anonymous source that the Mets are going to sign Anthony Swarzak. He doesn't have to tell you who told him. He's a reporter. He's reporting the information. The Mets at some point look like they're going to sign Anthony Swarzak. And when the Mets, as a team make that announcement, it backs up what Kareg says. So there's no need for him to cite exactly who it is that gave him that information. Now what John Heyman did is he got a quote from a Phillies player. And you know, I don't know if I lost it, so I may have to, uh, I may have to give it a little bit uh, verbatim. Actually, I am going to give it verbatim. Here you go. A player anonymously tells a reporter that the manager should stay out of the way. First of all, bad job by John Heyman. You know, and, it, and he, he does some good things when it comes to reporting, but when he does crap like this, it's a waste of everybody's time because it stirs up controversy when there's nobody to throw the controversy at. The only person that is going to benefit in a negative way is Gabe Kapler. Gabe Kapler's under fire. Somebody, somebody in the locker room said that the manager should stay out of the way. Now, if Gabe Kapler wanted to be a baby about it, which I know he's very professional, he's not going to go this route, he could go into his locker room and say, hey, what player said that I should stay out of the way? And not leave until, he, until either somebody outs him or the player admits to it. Or... Gabe Kapler could call John Heyman a liar. He has the right to do that. Because John Heyman didn't prove in any way that he even had a story. He's saying that an anonymous player said the manager should stay out of the way. Listen, I've given my take when it comes to anonymous sources. Anonymous sources very seldom make for a constructive story. Very seldom make for a, uh, you know, a story that is supposed to be based off of fact to carry any weight to it. So John Heyman, trying to stir up controversy, gets a player. And listen, I, up to a certain point, don't blame that player for not wanting to throw his name behind it. That being said, if you're not man enough to say that you got a problem with the way your manager is managing, you think he's a little overbearing, you think he should stay out of the way, be grown up enough 
to stand up to them and tell them that yourself. If not, you're a coward. And already you have an example, even though it hasn't been proven yet, anonymous sources aren't necessarily true, but you have a little example of the Philadelphia Phillies, a team that has sucked for the last four years. And you have at least one entitled player that's trying to tell his manager how things run here. That player might as well go out there and tell Gabe Kapler, you know how we run here? We lose 90 to 100 games every season. That's how we roll here. That player is a coward. And hopefully, that player can at some point become man, up, man enough to put his name behind those quotes. And John Heyman, shame on you. There's enough news going on in the world of baseball for you to report on than to have to throw some anonymous half-ass quote to say that some Phillies player says that the manager should stay out of the way. Find something better to do, John. Once again, John Pielli, Passball Show. Happy to be with you, number 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. Talk to Little Masters to start the show today. Um, obviously, you got Lee, and you got, I don't know, somebody else. You know, Fanai, Tony Fanai, four under, tied for first after the first round of the Masters. I'm going to talk a little basketball in a little bit, but staying on the baseball topic, uh, you know, you got the New York Mets coming off of a win against the Washington Nationals today, um, eight to two. Michael Conforto comes off the disabled list probably a couple weeks early, hits the game winning or the game deciding with the game winning RBI coming off of his two run homer he hits off of Steven Strasburg. And obviously, anytime a team starts out 5-1 and one, that has any talent to it, it's easy to get giddy. It's easy to get excited. It's easy to think that the Mets have turned a corner and are on their way to have a very good season. I've said all along that the National League East belongs to the Washington Nationals. And it belongs to the Washington Nationals for a number of reasons, but most importantly, this being their last shot, pretty much, with the entire band together to go out there and win themselves a World Series championship. They're coming off of a couple of years where they've won a division and gotten outed in the first round. They can't win a playoff series, but they have a good enough team that's up there with anybody else in the National League over the course of the regular season. Bryce Harper is going to be a free agent at the end of the year. Daniel Murphy is going to be a free agent at the end of the year. Gio Gonzalez is going to be a free agent at the end of the year. It's very likely that the 2019 Washington Nationals are going to look a lot different than the 2018 version. They've won three division titles in the last four years. They have Bryce Harper who is playing for that mega contract off to a very good start. They have a team that is ready to take that next step. 365 days from now, they may not be in that situation. So for those reasons and a couple others, I don't think there's any way that the Washington Nationals don't win this division. Obviously, they're battling a couple injuries. Daniel Murphy is out. You know, they have a tad bit of unrest if they're trying to put together their team going forward. Matt Wieters is on the disabled list. They signed Miguel Montero to a minor league contract. He's pretty much taken over the everyday catching duties. You got Scherzer and Strasburg, or two of the top pitchers in all Major League Baseball, but one thing you see in the month of April is these guys aren't gonna be maxed out. You're gonna expect them to get through six innings. If they end up having a high pitch count at any point, they're going to be pulled even earlier. So that advantage that the Washington Nationals would normally have by having Strasburg and Scherzer is not as prevalent in the month of April. So I look at the Nationals coming off of a loss to the New York Mets, and I'm not ready 
to dismiss them as being the supreme team in the National League East. Now, from the New York Mets perspective, they've had just about everything possible go right over the course of the first week of the season. I don't want to jinx it, but they've been extremely healthy. Last year at this time, Jerry Familia was suspended. They ended up losing Noah Syndergaard, Anuena Cespedes. It obviously derailed their team pretty early. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been trying to hold in that cough for about 10 minutes now. Looking at the team the way it comes out, as we hit the halfway point here at the passball show, try to keep it pretty quick. You know, the one injury they had, the one major concern that sat in front of them as this season started was Michael Conforto. Michael Conforto had a horrific, you know, dislocation of his shoulder during a swing in August last year. Cost him the rest of the season. He ended up having surgery and thought was, well, it was probably going to be a while before Michael Conforto helps them on the baseball field. Hopefully, he can be involved in spring training in some way, shape, or form, go through a rehabilitation assignment, and eventually get himself on the field, maybe in May, maybe in June, maybe even a little bit later. Now, usually, if you go back to the Mets of Christmas past, in regards to players when it comes to injuries, if there is a prognosis of when a player is supposed to come back, usually add a week or two weeks or a month to that. You can't ever assume or you can't ever expect the Mets player to come back on a disabled list when he's expected or reported by the doctors. Well, you got Michael Conforto, Sandy Alderson saying, hey, May 1st is a good day to aim as far as him being back and coming back on the field and helping the team out. It's April 5th. And Michael Conforto is leading off and playing center field. Not only that, but he's hitting a two-run home run off of Steven Strasburg in a 97-mile-an-hour fastball to left field to lead the Mets to a victory. Do I want to say bizarro world? Well, if you've seen the amount of injuries that the Mets have had to deal with over the last couple years, and trust me, you know, six games, there's no indication that everybody's going to stay healthy. But everything you've seen over this time almost seems like it's too good to be true. And I'm not saying this isn't a good baseball team. I think they are equipped to make a run for a wild card spot. I think if they, they play up at the level as they are right now, both offensively and on the mound, I think they could compete with the Washington Nationals. I think they could make a run for the National League East. In the end, I still think it's the Nationals' division to win or lose. That being said, you got to be happy with what you've seen over the first six games. You, you know, not only have the Mets' top four starting pitchers all gone out there, pitched, and not gotten hurt, but they have exactly what the Philadelphia Phillies don't have. They have that second layer of pitcher that's coming in with a, the ability to be a starter if he needs to be, but comes in fresh in the fourth, fifth, or sixth inning and is giving the Mets a jolt. And Gabe Kapler, who Phillies fans and a lot of people in the media are absolutely killing right now, has the right idea. He just doesn't have the right horses. In fact, going over to New York, you see that Mickey Calloway is essentially doing the same thing. You know why nobody's criticizing Mickey Calloway? Because the Mets are winning ball games. If the Philadelphia Phillies were 5-1 and one at this point, nobody would be criticizing Gabe Kapler for taking Nick Pavetta out after four innings. Nobody would be criticizing Gabe Kapler for taking Aaron Nola out after five and a third and 68 pitches on opening day. If the Phillies were winning, fans and the media tend to not care about the manager's style. It's all about wins and losses because there's a lot of similarities between the way that Gabe Kapler is running his bullpen and the way that Mickey Callaway is running his bullpen. If you look at a couple other first-time managers, Aaron Boone and Alex Cora with the Yankees and Red Sox respectively, they're not managing their bullpens the same way as the Phillies or the Mets. The Phillies look like they're outcasts because of the criticism that Gabe Kapler is taking for this. 
but it, the style and the quick hook, per se, the old Sparky Anderson reference from the 70s and 80s with the Reds and the Tigers, as he was known as Captain Hook, it's not working in Philadelphia, but it's working with the Mets. But the only reason we're not talking about it, or if we bring it up, it's in a way of, oh, what a great job by Lugo. What a great job by Gesellman. The difference between the Mets and the Phillies is the Mets' depth in regards to having starters who have the ability to pitch in the middle of the game. Not only that, but they've, they've had two starters in Gesellman and Lugo who have embraced the opportunity. Want to be on the baseball team number one, but also have taken to these roles and seem to be throwing the ball very well. I mean, Gesellman's throwing mid-90s with ridiculous movement on all his pitches. He's become a strikeout machine. The difference, once again, is the results. And the Mets pitchers, when they're coming in in the middle of the game, we tend to forget right off the bat what happened. Noah Syndergaard only pitched four innings the other day. Well, Robert Gesellman came in and threw up some zeros. Hansel Robles struck out the side. A.J. Ramos and Juris Familia you know, gave up one hit between them. So there's no talk about why did Noah Syndergaard only go four innings? Why did Mickey Callaway pull him after 92 pitches? You know, had Robert Gesellman come in, come in and give up a grand slam and the Mets end up getting blown out, fans would be going nuts. They say, why didn't you leave Syndergaard in? Yeah, you know, if he brought if he brought in Hobie Milner and Hobie Milner gave up a grand slam, he'd be like, "Why are you putting this bum in the game?" Syndergaard's on him out. But it all comes down to results, and we'll all continue to come down to results. And when we all try to sit here and say that there's this formula, there's just the way that baseball has to be played, and this way that managers and now their extended help they have with the front office and the analytics staff and the whole thing. They have to manage a game a certain way. No, you only have to manage a game one way in baseball when it comes to the fans and when it comes to the media. You have to manage a game to win. And if you win, nobody's going to give you a hard time. But if you lose, no matter what you did, it's wrong. It's going to be second-guessed. And that comes with the nature of the business. But for those that are going out there giving Gabe Kapler such a hard time, he, he is very confident in regards to what he wants to do. Now, if I'm Matt Clintack, if I'm the Philadelphia Phillies front office, I'm going to be more looking to cater my team towards what my manager is looking to do. Because I'm sure these are topics that were brought up during the interview process. The Phillies had an open managerial spot. Pete McCannon ended up taking a job in the front office. They were going to have a new manager coming into the 2018 season. Matt Klentak, the ownership, the front office, interviewed a series of candidates. Gabe Kapler went over. He had to have gone over what his philosophy was going to be with pitchers. That he's going to have maybe a little bit of a quick hook for him. He was going to study the numbers. If the numbers proved that the third time around the batting order was not good for a given pitcher, he was not going to put him out there. He wanted a deep bullpen. He wanted to have eight or nine guys there so we could go to a pitcher in the fourth inning or the fifth inning. Now, the Phillies may not have had the ability to bring in enough good pitchers. Maybe these pitchers did, could not come from outside organizations. You know, signing Lance Lynn to be a six starter and pitch in a bullpen would not have worked very well for Lance Lynn. The young pitchers that the Phillies have, they, it looks like they're trying to use Jake Thompson in, in, a, in a similar type of role to the way the Mets are using Gisellman and using Luga. Is he ready for it? You need the right type of pitcher that can embrace that role, pitch multiple innings, and obviously the poster child to that is Andrew Miller with the Cleveland Indians. He was a guy that was pitching ninth innings for the Yankees. The Indians acquired him. They already had a closer in Cody Allen. They already had an eighth-inning guy in Brian Shaw. And they started using Andrew Miller in the sixth inning, in the seventh inning. In the postseason, they go to him in the fifth inning or the fourth inning to get high-leverage outs in high-leverage situations. 
Not every team is blessed with the type of arms to be able to do that. Number one, to have them by name, to have somebody that you could go to, but also to have somebody that's good enough to embrace that type of role. So I think the Phillies, with Gabe Kapler and his mindset, are going to do very well. They just might not do well this year. And I think it's up for the front office and Matt Klintak to address the pitching situation, maybe go outside the organization, maybe try to swing a deal for a, a useful arm that you can use in the fourth or fifth or sixth inning and have two or three options every single game, make sure those guys are rested, and try to get to the seventh inning or the eighth inning. And be able to use your top relievers, your Nishaks and your Hunters when healthy. And then, of course, Hector Norris as your closer. But for all those that are knocking Gabe Kapler, he just needs the right horses. And the fans that want to bow him, I said, listen, opening day, especially in a big market, that's the one time you got free range. Go out there and bow your ass off if you want. It's the one chance that you have as a fan that shows up on opening day. Which, by the way, at the beginning of the week, we talk about diehard fans going opening day. How many people call themselves diehard fans and don't go to opening day? It's a lousy job. You don't have to go every year. But if you don't make any effort to go opening day and call yourself a diehard Phillies fan or a diehard Nationals fan or a diehard Mets fan or a diehard Yet. Yankees fan, if you're a diehard fan, get your ass to opening day. Once again, John Pielli, Pass Ball Show, the number if you're interested, 732-364-3598. That's 732-364-3598. I'll throw this out there again, a reminder, next Monday, which will be the 9th, I believe, April 9th, I'll be on, uh, be the return of Game Over on 1450 AM WCTC in Somerset, New Jersey. We'll be on, and Mike Sanfilippo and myself will be on from 7 to 9. We're going to keep the feed going. So we'll do Facebook Live, we'll do Periscope, you know, while, while we're live on WCTC to keep the show available. You miss the show, you can't go to the website, unfortunately, on WCTC and be able to listen to it. So, you know, if you miss it, you know, if you don't, Check it out till the next morning. It'll be all available to you. You'll hear Mike Sam Flippo and myself probably doing a hockey playoff preview. Um, we'll be on for two hours, so we'll obviously get into baseball. We'll talk about you know the upcoming NFL draft, and we'll also open up the phone lines and take anybody's call that feels like calling in. Big story today out in the NBA with Kyrie Irving. His injury is going to keep him out for the rest of the season, and he's going to need another uh, surgery. Um, he went underwent knee surgery on March 24th, was expected to be back during the postseason. He's going to need another surgery on his knee, and the worst has been confirmed. Kyrie Irving will be out for the rest of the season, and including the playoffs. Now, the Boston Celtics have been in a very good position for in the Eastern Conference, They've lost that number one spot. They're three games behind the Toronto Raptors, who have been a very quiet team, a team that nobody really believes in. But with the Cleveland Cavaliers, it amidst a little bit of turmoil, amidst a little bit of trouble, doesn't seem like everything's going as great. They're not running rough shot over their, you know, the respective league. However, they are playing pretty good basketball now. They've won nine of their last ten. They're sitting there at 48 and 30. They seem to be hitting their stride. The Boston Celtics, by getting Irving, kind of gave them an advantage that they didn't have last year when they were playing against the Cavaliers. This is a team that looked to grow. They were off to a fantastic start. And they're still in a very good position. You know, having a number two seed in the Eastern Conference is nothing to be ashamed of, especially if you're ahead of the Cleveland Cavaliers. You match up against the Cavs at some point in the postseason, then you, you end up having that home, you know, that, that home court advantage, just like they did last year. The team that I'd be concerned about is a team that's absolutely on fire right now, and that's the Philadelphia 76ers. They've won 12 games in a row. 
They're 18 games over 500, currently tied with the Cleveland Cavaliers for the third spot in the Eastern Conference. And now I think this is a time where we really can start to take this team seriously. I thought coming out of, you know, into the season, the team that had the best chance of beating the Cavaliers, who obviously have been to the NBA Finals the last three years, winning, of course, two years ago. I, I looked at the Celtics with Kyrie having that little bit of an advantage and having a chance to make it their year. You had all the disgruntledness going on in Cleveland. The players that were, you know, calling out, you know, whatever they were trying to call out. They they didn't didn't believe they were an NBA championship team. They were calling out the coach. They were calling out each other. Which once again, all anonymous sources were reporting this. This was Boston's chance. And my question is, what does this mean for the Boston Celtics going forward when you not only have the news about Irving, that he's not going to be available for the playoffs, and I'm sure Kyrie was looking forward to it, him coming back in the playoffs just in time to face the Cleveland Cavaliers, the team that traded him, which, by the way, was because Kyrie wanted to go. But this happens at the same time as the Philadelphia 76ers are playing potentially the best basketball in the entire NBA. The Sixers are in the playoffs, a place they haven't been for a while. They're getting set for maybe the season ended today, they'd be playing at home against Indiana. Indiana's been another team that has performed fairly well. You got Miami, you got Washington, you got Milwaukee. And on the outside looking in, you got Detroit and you got Charlotte. The good thing about the Eastern Conference this year, which we haven't seen in years past, it looks like every playoff team is going to be legitimately over 500. You're not going to have an under 500 team make it in the Eastern Conference to the playoffs, or a team that's 500 or just a couple games over. So you're going to have eight deserving teams going in the Eastern Conference. And remember, the Philadelphia 76ers, before their 12-game winning streak, were only six games over 500. That's where the Milwaukee Bucks are right now. That's where the Washington Wizards are right now. Miami is seven games over 500. So the, 70, uh, the 76ers went from being kind of in that grouping with Washington and Milwaukee and Miami to all of a sudden getting themselves not only a home playoff game, but the potential to grab the number three seed. And is there enough time? No, nah, there's not enough time to catch you know, Boston for the number two seed. And in fact, Boston, you know, is essentially going to have to win out if they want to beat out Toronto for the number one seed in Eastern Conference. The Kyrie in injury, which obviously we knew about already, we knew he wasn't going to play the rest of the season. We're expecting him back at some point in the playoffs. This is devastating news to the season of the Boston Celtics. And as you get ready for the playoffs... I look at Toronto and Boston and Cleveland and Philadelphia and would expect them to all be in positions to get to the next round. In other words, the teams that they're matched up against or potentially going to face over the course of a series, they are the better team. Upsets happen all the time. But, you know, Philadelphia against Toronto, you can see potentially a Boston-Cleveland in the Eastern Conference semifinals. It's going to be interesting to see the way it works out. Obviously, on the West, the big story this year has been Houston, 63-15, and 15, have clinched the, uh, you know, the number one seed, something that nobody thought was going to happen this year. The Golden State Warriors, who have obviously one of the most stacked teams that we've seen over the last decade or so. you got the Warriors sitting there at number two. Portland's had a good year. It looks like they've locked number three. And then the other four... Five teams in a conference have yet to clinch a playoff spot. You got Denver sitting there at number nine at 43 and 35. You have the Clippers at 42 and 36. So two teams with a well over 500 record that are on the outskirts of the playoffs looking in. You got Minnesota, you got New Orleans, you got Oklahoma City, San Antonio, and Utah. Utah looks like they're in. They're about another win or so away from clinching. San Antonio is right behind them. Oklahoma City is right behind them. And then you got New Orleans and Minnesota. Minnesota, obviously, a very good up-and-coming team. They've 
pretty similar to the Philadelphia 76ers, have succeeded in building through the draft. They've had some god-awful seasons. They've had some bad performances, and they've been able to stockpile some very good draft picks. But, you know, ended up trading Kevin Love to the Cavaliers, got Andrew Wiggins back in that deal. Of course, made the deal this past offseason for Jimmy Butler. And I'm looking at it, if there's two teams, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people echo my feelings with this, if there's two teams that you would want to root for based off of how far they've come in the NBA, it's the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Philadelphia 76ers. Now, will there be a Minnesota-Philadelphia NBA Finals? No, probably not. You know, Golden State looks like they're still the favorite to get there in the in the Western Conference. Steph Curry is going to join them at some point in the postseason. It's going to be interesting to say a Houston Golden State Western Conference final may be as intriguing of a matchup as we've seen over the last four years. Golden State still, until they get knocked off, is going to be favored and not only to go to the finals but to win it. I don't feel the same way about the Cleveland Cavaliers. Though I think the deadline deals that they made when they overhauled their roster, brought in you know Rodney Hood and brought in George Hill, you know Larry Nance Jr. and Clarkson, they made some very shrewd moves, which seems to have helped the cohesion in regards to the rest of the roster. They're playing better the way that they're set right now as opposed to the way their roster was set at the beginning of the season. I still don't look at Cleveland as being the favorite. Now, I'm not ready to jump on the bandwagon of Toronto, though they deserve it. They deserve the credit. They deserve to be the team to beat, regard, you know, regardless of what has happened in the past. Toronto and Houston have had the best records in their respective conferences, have earned the number one seeds, in spite of all the doubt. But I look at Boston, and I tell you, they were dealt a very big blow with you know, getting the, the news that Kyrie Irving's not going to join them at all in the postseason. Gordon Hayward, and they lost in the first game of the season. Big loss for them. Imagine that team with those two players on the court. They are probably better than any team in that Eastern Conference. Now are the Cavaliers playing their best basketball at the right time? I'd want to see them, not only how they finish their last four games, but how do they perform in their first round series? It looks like I think there's enough of a spread, but obviously they got to hold off Philadelphia. They'll be playing either Miami, most likely Miami, but could also be playing Indiana. I want to see how they perform in that first series. If it's a series that goes the distance, if they show some flaws, then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe that a Boston or Toronto or even a Philadelphia could come out of that conference. If they seem to build off of what they've done over the last week or two weeks, seem to be clicking on all cylinders and blow past their first round opponent, we may be looking at another Cleveland Golden State Finals in the NBA. Tomorrow we're going to be on from 8 to 9 p.m. as we do a Friday night version of the Pass Ball Show. We'll obviously have a Masters recap. Uh, we're going to talk a little NHL as we get set for the postseason. New Jersey Devils play tonight. The opportunity to clinch a spot, a playoff spot in the Eastern Conference for the first time in a long time. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes out. But we will break down a little hockey tomorrow. Well, obviously, we're going to talk about ma the Masters and a little more baseball. And, of course, whatever's on your mind, you know, keep the tweets coming. You know, I'll, I'll, I, every day I work in some of the topics in regards to what I talk about, stuff that I've discussed with people through Twitter, uh, things that interest me in regards to perspectives that I've seen on different topics. Obviously, the Gabe Kapler situation, I'm telling you this. Um, if you're a Phillies fan, or even if you're not a, a Phillies fan, maybe you're just a baseball fan that's ragging on Gabe Kapler right now, he's going to be a good manager. And he may not necessarily have the right pitchers to get through the bullpen, you know, to pull his starters when he wants to right now. But I really believe this. I think this is a guy that's going to be a, a very good major league manager. And what he's doing with his pitchers is not only going to work at some point, but it's going to revolutionize the sport. 
because you're seeing other teams do it. You watch the Los Angeles Dodgers do it in the World Series and the postseason last year. The Houston Astros, when they weren't running out Dallas Keuchel and Justin Verlander, were doing the same thing. Remember, Charlie Morton and Lance McCullers. And then Lance McCullers and Charlie Morton. They piggybacked those pitchers off of each other twice in two huge Game 7 wins in the ALCS and in the World Series. So for those that are out there in Philadelphia or that average baseball fan that just wants to rag on Gabe Kapler, his style in regards to managing a bullpen and pulling his pitcher early based off of matchups, pitch count, and avoiding the third time through the batting order has already been proven to work. And if you look over in Queens and you see what Mickey Calloway and Dave Island are doing with the New York Mets, they're doing the exact same thing. You know why no fans are getting on Mickey Calloway and Dave Island? Because the Mets are winning. Winning cures everything. Nobody cares how you won as long as you win. But if you lose, every single thing you do is going to be dissected. So we'll be back with you tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Past Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com as well as St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson. We'll be back with you at 8, 8 p.m. tomorrow Eastern. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.